Yeah. So the, the one comment on the, the quiz questions that I have, uh, a lot of folks all did the quick thing with Google and looked up Nicomachus. And the one that comes up for the most part, of course, is the mathematician. So everybody wrote back the mathematician. But if you notice, the mathematician lived hundreds of years after Aristotle. So it's pretty clear Aristotle wouldn't have named his Nicomachean ethics in honor of a mathematician that hadn't been born yet. Um, but if you read the biography of Aristotle, you would have noticed that his father was named Nicomachus, and his son he had named Nicomachus. So my guess is it was named in honor of his son. Or his son might have even had something to do with it being called that. So, not sure. But that was just a fun, fun question for you to look up things. And it, it does show me that when you read Google and look things up, you can't just read the first thing that comes up and think, aha, here's the answer. You have to kind of think about wait a minute now, what's, what's the possibility that this would be the one that's relevant here? You know, so that's where so-called critical thinking gets involved in reading what you see there. Plus, you've probably heard what Abraham Lincoln said, you can't trust everything you read on the internet. That's a joke. Okay. A, couple of you, a couple of you caught that. Um, the reason we have this page up is because someone asked a question about test one. What do they do? Test one is due in two weeks, I believe. Let me, let me double check. The 18th, is that right? Wait a minute. Back up. First exam is due. This isn't a touch screen, obviously. February 18th. But remember, I want you to like me, so if you've got a good reason for not sending it in on time, you're drunk or, you know, you fell asleep or, Great reasons. or you know, whatever. As long as I get all the answers, everything I need for your grade by the end of the semester, when I turned in your grade, because I will be honest, and if I've only gotten a C's worth of, of essays, et cetera, then that's what I'll put. So every, every year I, I tell folks that if you want an A, you just give me everything you need to get an A, and everybody can get an A. And every year, not everybody gets an A. I always end up with a few folks that are, where did they, they go? They never even sent me anything, or they sent me a few things and then disappeared off the face of the earth. I'm left emailing people and trying to figure out, hello, are you dead? You know, I, I do read the obituaries just in case any students disappeared. I've, done stuff. I've actually had that happen. That's kind of, or, uh, the one uh, student was a A student in a logic class and two weeks after the course was over, she was killed in an accident. Terrible. It was in Wasilla. Hmm. However, so any other questions on Nicomachus or anything of that sort? Then we'll keep on moving. Um, so Aristotle, you think of one of the main things that we'll see, I think, that, that causes a problem uh, in the future because of Aristotle's thinking was his concept of the soul as being the activity of the body, which if you think about it, that means that the soul is dependent on the body existing. And so when we think of uh, Plato's account of the soul, once the body dies, the soul is free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last, right? You know, but uh, 
with uh, Aristotle, no, the soul seems to dissipate because there's no more activity of the body as a result. Or as you might actually go and you look at a dead body, what you discover, as Aristotle did, that there's tons of life in a dead body. In fact, it seems actually more alive after it's dead than it was, you know, while it was still up and about, you know, because it's full of maggots and, and all these other things that are eating the body, right? So in a sense, the body's still got a spirit or, act, you know, a, an activity, but now it's crawling with worms, right, et cetera, that are my chambermaids, so Juliet says, right? Um, so you wouldn't want to think of that as, as life, you know, after death, right? Um, uh, so clearly we're going to see a problem uh, when you think uh, that uh, the concept of the soul is, uh, you know, the concept of the real us, you know, our soul. And so our lives are essentially going to have a sense of meaning because of the way we live our lives, which will lead us to a afterlife, which will be a reward for a life well lived, right? Well, that's Plato, and that will become the Christian worldview, especially with St. Augustine, as we see. But when you look at Aristotle, the problem, of course, is that no, there's going to be no afterlife. You've got to get your uh, reward in this life while you're alive, right? And if that's the case, then the question becomes, what is eudaimonia? What is flourishing? You know, that's what we want to have. We want to have it while we're alive. Uh, so the the kind of tr typical Christian feeling that you should sacrifice, control the body, prevent the body from enjoying itself because that will reward the soul in the afterlife, well, that goes away and you begin looking at how do I enjoy life while I have it. Uh, so we will see the post-Aristotelians. And the post-Aristotelians... Um, I like to think of them as kind of giving us a range of responses to Aristotle's question. How do we uh, get uh, uh, a best life? Uh, and that, um, if we, we think of it, I can use this primitive source. This, this is called a whiteboard. Is that okay? Maybe I should change it and call it a multicultural board just to be safe, but that could have been funny or not. I know how to use these devices too. So if I go back a little and I put Socrates <coughs> up top, and then Plato, and then Aristotle. Did we spell out all those right, right? So we might even think of the first one as kind of somewhat skipping Aristotle, and that would be the cynics, the cynic philosophy. The cynic philosophy, uh, especially uh, highlighted by, the, I guess, the most famous of them, which is Diogenes. Here in this picture, you see he's living in a barrel, which apparently was the case. Um, he's an example of a homeless dude. It's pretty sophisticated, right, terminology? But you know what I mean, a homeless dude? So homeless. And homeless on purpose. The reason he's homeless it's because he doesn't want the bother of taking care of an estate, a home, family, stuff. There's stories about him, for example, he came to a well uh, and was going to get a drink and he got out his cup. And he was going to get a cup full of water and it 
kid came over and reached out with his hands and got a, a drink of water without a cup. And he realized the cup was superfluous. He didn't need it, so he threw it away. He didn't want any concerns, any stuff that he didn't absolutely need in order to live a happy life. So he's trying to lead a happy, flourishing life without any worries, responsibilities, concerns, just doing whatever made him happy at the moment, from moment to moment. And so it's referred to as the cynic, because the word is the same root as canine, which means dog. So this is the dog philosophy. dog philosophy. Literally, if you think of it this way, dogs don't worry, they don't own homes, they don't wear clothes, they don't take care of their families, except for the bitch who gets to nurse the pups for however long it takes them to be weaned, and then she you know, kicks them out. <laughs> Goodbye. We, you know, get ready for the next batch. You know, whatever however that works. Um, and I'm sure if she knew she could take pills to avoid all that, she probably would. I don't know, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Am I allowed to say stuff like that? No, uh, sorry. Uh, but you get the idea, right? The cynic philosophy, traditionally, is the dog philosophy. Homeless, not in the sense that they're mentally ill or, or Perhaps you could also uh, think of the individuals that do like to drink. That's what they want to do. They think that's the flourishing life, is spend time drinking, you know, that kind of thing. So I, when I see folks uh, downtown and so on, I, I, of course, don't know why they're there. Uh, but uh, I, I might think, you know, as they're holding up their cardboard signs, what kind of cardboard sign I would have. Actually, I would laminate mine. I would want it to be nice things of that sort, you know, you know, need money to pay for my Audi, you know, you know, that kind of thing, probably not, I don't know, I saw one guy dressed in a suit by the Diamond Mall that was, you know, asking for money for his mortgage once, you know, I thought, well, that's got to be pretty good, but the cynic, be one, right, and you might think of that as directly coming from Socrates, I don't know how much of it would have gone through at least Aristotle um, in the tradition. Uh, in fact, uh, Diogenes was a, a contemporary, so apparently, of Alexander. So that would have been uh, an individual that's still around while Aristotle was. Right? Um, but that's that's the one extreme. This is this is where you're giving up all of your attachments to the society. You're just trying to be completely free on your own. Then the next one is Epicurus. And his is the name that they've given his philosophy. So they're Epicureans, right? Or Epicureanism, right? Um, and if we look at Epicurus, He's an unusual looking Greek because he's got a nose that isn't broken. That's, yeah, that was a joke too. For some reason, a lot of the statues, the, the busts, have broken noses. I, you know. um, Epicurus is interesting because we also have um, writings by him. And I have uh, one of them a uh, link. You could, you could of course, check. Uh, remember on this site, you could browse. And one of the things you can see is that there's not only the letter 
Uh, but we also have his principal doctrines, uh, which you could look at. Um, but when we, we do look at these, what we see um, is sort of a, a practical wisdom on how to lead a good life, eudaimonia, if you, if you will, right, flourishing, um, right? I, I don't know if I explained eudaimonia, what Aristotle calls uh, the flourishing life, really, is eu is the prefix for good, right? And then daimon is demon, right? So, you, you know, the, the word we use, demon, uh, comes from, but in the Greek, it's not always a bad thing. So you can have good demons and bad demons. It do, just doesn't mean, uh, you know, evil demons. You know, that, but what do the demon? What does the demon do? It kind of takes over you. So so you're driven by this demonic uh, aspect. Uh, so so when you're living the kind of life uh, that is meant by Aristotle, eudaimonia, you're experiencing an ecstatic feeling of happiness, right? You're, you're, you're literally thrilled, you're, right? You're reaching what we might call ecstasy, right? Ecstasy means you're almost out of yourself with happiness, right? You know, because you're so possessed by the joy of whatever it is that you're doing. Of course, now, if you're thinking this is a bad demon, then, of course, that, that would mean you're being possessed by something evil, right? So you'd see how it would go um, both ways. But so how do we end up with that kind of life that literally gives us that wonderful feeling, at least as much of the time as possible? Um, Epicurus argues that it's living with all of the comforts and things, making sure you have a good diet, not extreme, not weird. You know, in fact, there's a lot of things he lists as you should not eat these because they're bad for you, right? So it's kind of a sane diet. Um, but he also uh, wants to be self-supporting. He doesn't want to be dependent on other people because if you are, then they could screw you over, right? So what you... You need to be as self-sufficient. Okay? So in a sense, I think, putting this in Alaskan terms, the closest example of what this might be would be like the bush way of life. Bush in the sense of you, you know, build your own little cabin out in the woods. You know, you and your wife and you know, your kids, you go out and raise your own family out in the woods where you're growing your own fruits and vegetables or, or whatever you can grow. Or maybe have a little greenhouse or something. You do your hunting and fishing uh, and so on so that you're, you're self-contained uh, uh, in, in the way you uh, raise your family because this way you don't have to worry about obligations to society. Don't, don't send your kids to schools. Instead, homeschool them, right? Take care of them on your own because you don't want those attachments to the society because that brings obligations. And those obligations are annoying. You have to go to committee meetings, you have to go to the PT, you have to pay taxes, etc. cetera. Uh, so I, I think, you know, not only maybe, a, you know, the Bush mentality, but even the folks that are kind of a little off, uh, you know, the, the norm and, and feel like they, they want to be sovereign you ever heard that expression? Yes, that's, you know, there's a couple, couple interesting cases even in Alaska of people that feel that you know, they ought not to be uh, required to pay taxes or uh, any of that sort of thing. But you know, at the same time, if you threaten <coughs> judges and stuff with you know, killing them if they you know, find you guilty for not paying your taxes, that's obviously not something. Are you familiar with that at all? So Epicurus. Now, what happens to Epicurus's philosophy is very strange. During Nero's period, when, when, you, when you look at his, his writing, you know, exercise yourself in those, holding them to be the elements of right life and so on. 
So this is all very practical kinds of stuff. Custom yourself, this is interesting. One of the things that's going to work, make you worried and, and so you know, lose sleep over this would be death, worrying about death. And so he argues death is nothing to us. For good and evil imply awareness and death is the privation of all awareness. Therefore, a right understanding that death is nothing to us makes the mortality of life enjoyable, not by adding to life an unlimited time, but by taking away the yearning after immortality. Now, for life has no terror for those who thoroughly apprehend that there are no terrors for them in ceasing to live. Foolish, therefore, is the person who says that he fears death, not because it will pain when it comes, but because it pains in the prospect. Whatever causes no annoyance when it is present causes only a groundless pain in the expectation. Death, therefore, the most awful of evils, is nothing to us, seeing that when we are, death is not come, and when death is come, we are not. It is nothing, then, either to the living or to the dead, for with the living it is not, and the dead exists no longer, etc. So, so don't worry about it. <laughs> The worrying about it is the worst part of it. Right? So, I don't know though. My wife and I have already taken a stroll over at the Fort Rich Cemetery because uh, she wanted to see what it was going to look like there. You know, when I'm no longer with her. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's kind of annoying. You know. You know. Although, the worst of it was realizing that they don't allow humor on any of the tombstones, the memorial stones. It's just name, rank, you know, et cetera. You know, not, no jokes like, this is the toughest spot I've ever been in, which, you know, that's, that's the one I, I was thinking I'd like to have on there. You know? So, uh, there is reference to the gods, by the way, um, uh, but in... Uh, he points out uh, um, let me see where but basically the gods exist but it's just dumb to think that they care about us at all you know, why, why? Uh, basically I'm thinking this is like gravity you know there is gravity but it's dumb to think that if I please gravity don't let me fall down the steps you know, it's not going to help right? you know, you've got to learn to be careful on the steps when they're covered in ice, right? You know, that's, that's how you get along with gravity, right? Okay. But so that's kind of interesting. All right. So, Epicurus. But let me show you this. This is how the Romans misinterpreted uh, that. Um, 